Okay, thank you for coming in this uh, really early in the morning. And uh, uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Aditya. I'm working in the uh, Astrophysical Relativity Group. I'm a second year graduate student. And this is some work that I've been doing over the past one, one and a half years in collaboration with uh, Sumit, who was a postdoc here, Saket, who was an SN Bhatt student, and Ajit. Uh, what we're basically trying to do is trying to probe large scale structure. Now, when I say large scale structure, I mean large scale in the cosmological scale, so the very largest scales in the cosmos itself. Uh, so I'll just write down a few units which, which might be of help. So uh, in astronomical units, one parsec is equal to 3.26 light years. And of course, one megaparsec is 10 power 6 parsec. So the, uh, the scales that, are, that I'm dealing with are almost always greater than one megaparsec. So that is the uh, distance scale that I'm dealing with. So with that, that out of the way, I'll start my talk. OK, so I guess uh, some of you might recognize this map. This is the map from the cosmic microwave background. Um, from these maps like these, we can show that the universe is actually statistically homogeneous and isotropic at large distance scales, greater than 100 megaparsec or so. And uh, the statistical properties of the uh, matter distribution in the universe, uh, and this is a proxy for the matter distribution in the universe, enables us to infer the evolution properties of the universe, right? Um, OK, I don't know what I did. OK, OK, so then um, uh, wa so we want to probe the matter distribution in the universe, the matter content of the universe. So one easy way to do it is by using galaxies as a proxy for matter. And um, uh, but also one, one disclaimer that I would like to make is that most of the matter in the universe is actually in form of dark matter. And the galaxies that we see do contain dark matter, but they, uh, what we see is also most, mostly baryonic matter. But, and we use galaxies to be a proxy for that dark, that dark matter. And in galaxy surveys, a galaxy survey is when you just point a telescope out to the sky and just look for galaxies in the sky. And uh, one probes these over densities in, so you imagine the cosmos as a fluid having some density rho. It's a homogeneous isotropic fluid. And then you, you say that there might be some over densities in the fluids here and there. And you characterize that over density by this over density parameter called delta. Delta is a function of the three dimensional r. And uh, it's defined as the density at, at point r minus the, uh, minus the average density normalized by the average, dens uh, normalized by the average density itself. And then you can find this quantity called the xi r, which is called the two point correlation function, by just taking an ensemble average of delta at x and delta at x plus r over all, uh, all configurations of x. Now, what is this two-point correlation function? Uh, the, the most physical way of understanding the two-point correlation function is that it is related to the excess probability of finding two points separated by a distance r. So let's say you have a lot of Poisson distributed uh, points in a box. You want to find the probability distribution of the excess probability of finding two points in that box separated by a distance r. And hence, uh, you, can, you can easily, this, is, this can be easily shown that the, uh, the two-point correlation function xi r is basically, uh, one plus xi r is basically proportional to the excess probability. And uh, of course, we can, we can use this formula and try to you know, uh, find this quantity xi r. But from uh, galaxy surveys, where you have millions of points in that box that I mentioned, uh, what people do is people use estimators for this correlation function. So one simple estimator for, for this correlation function is something called the DDRR estimator. Uh, OK, so what is DD? Uh, you take the data, which is just a survey of galaxies. You calculate, you take pairs of points. So let's say you have n points in the data. So you have like nc2 pairs of data points. And you calculate nc2 distances, and, uh, the, and you say, how many, um, you ask the question, how many points are actually uh, separated by distance r? You call that number dd of r. And you divide that number by uh, the same quantity, but now the points are just randomly distributed. So this dd comes from the galaxy survey itself. The rr comes from your random simulation. 
Like you just create random points and you divide the DD by RR and you get your Xi R. Uh, so that is the easiest way to find it from data. It's a very fast method, so uh, it can be done in almost like you know a few seconds actually for for very small surveys. And uh, uh, there is some some special modified version of this. It's just details, but then there there is a more uh, reliable version of it called the Landy ZLA estimator. Is just you add just one extra term and that's it. And uh, so that is how you measure this Xi of R. And the power spectrum is just the Fourier transform, the three-dimensional Fourier transform of this correlation function. It contains exactly the same information, right? So uh, here in this image, basically, this is the measurement of the Xi S or Xi R from a, a, a galaxy survey called the SDSS, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. As you can see, uh, there is this peak around 100 H inverse megaparsec. This peak is called the Baryon Acoustic Peak, and I'll tell you more about that. Uh, so okay, as I said, it's called the Baryon Acoustic Peak. Now you will ask me why does that, is that peak present in the data itself? So uh, they, there is a lot of physics, there is very, very rich physics behind this. At very early times, the universe was hot. There were, the photons were coupled to the protons, the charged particles by Compton scattering. And hence, uh, in, this, in this effective fluid that was the universe at the very start, in this hot fluid, there is this, this radiation overpressure sets up waves in the fluid. But what happens is uh, eventually the universe cools down. The protons and neutrons, sorry, the protons and electrons can now combine to form neutral atoms. And now the photons, because they can't, can't get in Compton scattered by the charged particles, they just stream free and reach the Earth, let's say, uh, a billion, uh, order of 10 billion years later, as, let's say, CMB radiation or something like that. Uh, and this, the wave in the photon baryon fluid, the wave that was set up, is now halted because, because there is no effective, uh, what do you say, coupling between the protons, electrons, and the photons. And hence, there is some excess density as some scales, which means there's an excess probability of finding two points separated by certain distance. And that shows up in the current data as this peak. Uh, this peak is very important because you can do a lot of cosm precise cosmological measurements. For example, you can constrain the Hubble constant with this peak. Uh, okay, so that's it with this peak, but uh, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, the galaxies are actually not completely made up of dark matter. They're only a proxy for the dark matter distribution in the universe, and hence they're a biased tracer of the underlying dark matter distribution. Uh, by using some linear approximations, we can model this bias by just an overall multiplicative constant on the correlation function of dark matter. So what that literally means if, is that if you calculate the correlation function from galaxies and you want to compare it to the correlation function from dark, mat dark matter, there will be an effective multiplicative constant called B square, which is called the bias. And the bias is actually related to the dark matter halo mass. So uh, dark matter clumps together and forms really dense regions. And this bias factor is actually related to the dark matter halo mass. And hence, it also is indirectly related to the galaxy population that forms in the dark matter halos. Uh, so uh, the point of all this is that with, with enough observations of galaxies, one can localize this BO peak. You can um, understand what, where exactly this BO peak lies, the Baryon acoustic peak, and also constrain the bias factor. OK. So now uh, I, I, I said nothing about gravitational waves in, so far. So why is, why is gravitational waves coming into the picture here? So uh, as, uh, uh, so the, you, you might have heard about the binary neutron star event. Uh, the binary neutron star event uh, actually constrained the Hubble constant to about, I think, around 15%. Future, future uh, binary neutron star merger detections can actually constrain the Hubble constant to about a few percent, like a couple of, uh, comparable to the current constraints from the CMB or the supernovae. Uh, and next generation detectors, by next generation I mean detectors that will be online in around 10 to 15 years, will actually probe very, very high redshifts, z equal to 10, which, which basically means we will probe all the black holes merging in the universe, or all the binary neutron stars merging in the universe through that redshift. And uh, they will be also sensitive to many more black hole mergers, around a million per year. Right? So uh, right now, we detect binary black holes at the rate of one per week. We will be detecting binary black holes at the rate of one per minute in the next 15 years. And, uh, can we, so the question naturally to ask is can we probe the large scale structure using the binary black hole observations because we literally have a survey of black holes, binary black holes now. Okay, 
So uh, more questions that can be asked are, uh, are binary black holes distributed like galaxies? Can we probe the binary baryon acoustic oscillations with just gravitational wave observations? And does the power spectrum or the correlation function evolve with the redshift? But there's one very big challenge here in the fact that unlike galaxies, gravitational wave events are not well localized in three-dimensional space, as you can see here. So each, each of these streaks is actually the localization region of a binary black hole in the sky, even with future detectors. So what that means is you can't measure distances accurately between black holes. And because you can't measure distances accurately between black holes, you can't measure the correlation function to that accuracy which you can measure with uh, galaxies. Okay. So, uh, so then what we do is uh, we have to deal with this, uh, this localization error. So we collect the localization distributions in a certain redshift bin, uh, estimate the correlation function using the estimator that I mentioned, and uh, compare this estimation with some analytical expectations which will not be the same as your normal expectation. So for example, uh, let's say, uh, let's, I want you to concentrate on the red curve, let's say, which is around at the correlation function which is expected from theory at z equal to 0 0.7. And uh, as you can see, that you can see a clear baryon acoustic peak at around 100. But when you put in the localization errors due to the gravitational waves, you see that this, wave, this, this peak is just washed away and you have something like this. So we have to deal with it. This is the only thing that we can measure. So with most gravitational wave observations, we won't be able to measure the baryon acoustic peak. Uh, Okay, this is just, you know, just, just to show you that, you know, in every redshift bin uh, using future detectors, this is number of events per year at every redshift. You will be measuring around, let's say around redshift of one, you'll be measuring 5,000 events per year. Okay, so uh, basically what I did is uh, I simulated gravitational waves as the binary black hole, gravitational wave from binary black hole events as we will be seeing in the future. And, uh, and I and I calculate the correlation function, I try to, uh, I try to fit it with the, some uh, analytical prediction and measure the bias. So the bias that I had put in while, while creating the gravitation wave events was 1.5, and as you can see, I can recover that with an error buzz. Uh, okay, so, so that the point of my work is that uh, you can treat the binary black holes as an effective survey of binary black holes, and then you can use this survey to measure some large scale structure properties. Uh, there's some ongoing work. What, what astrophysics can we do with the bias factor? Is bias factor est estimation uh, better in the Fourier space, in the power spectrum space, because the different K modes are uh, disentangled? How does the bias factor evolve as a function of redshift? Can we detect the BEO peak at some redshift? This would be really important because then we can probe more deeper cosmological facts. And also, can we get some information about how these binary black holes form? OK, thank you. Uh. Questions? Yeah. I can't hear you very clearly. Sorry. You showed a plot of some correlation function. What was the correlation function? So, uh, okay, maybe. Uh, yeah, the, the, that one. Oh. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, I'm, I'm trying to go back to one of the slides where. Yeah, so the correlation function is defined like this, where delta r is just the over density in the universe. So rho, you model the universe as a fluid with some density rho. Uh, you, cal you find the rho over density as some rho r minus average rho divided by average rho. And you, cal you define the correlation function as just the ensemble average of this delta into delta x into delta x plus r over all x. This is what? This is black hole density, or uh, this is the oh, this is the cosmological matter density. And what was the plot? Uh, th th uh. So this is how it looks actually. Okay, so yeah, okay. I, I mean, uh, from theory, is it known like uh, is there a prediction of this uh, the wavelength of this uh, baryonic? Uh, yeah, yeah. So this is exactly the wavelength, right? From theory, you can yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, so it's more like you have some parameters which you can then fit to know. Yeah. yeah, so for different parameters, you'll have the peak at different locations, but you, your universe only corresponds to one set of parameters. So that is what you measure using these things. And this, uh, 
uh, also fits with some other observation, like that same parameter? Yeah, yeah. So basically, there is an Hubble. So for example, a Hubble constant measurement can be done with the peak itself. So, uh, so yeah, and that matches with like, you know, some other observables as well. Uh, okay, uh, let us thank uh, the speaker. Uh, uh,